Okay, so we are now transitioning quickly to our last segment of the program. It's now 10.30, about 10.30 uh, p.m. in Central Europe. It's uh, a much more convenient time in uh, San Francisco from where our next uh, segment host uh, will be uh, connected. And uh, Easy Event, I'm talking about Unity Stokes, uh, co-founder of Startup Health, was held in the context of the JP Morgan as every year, the Startup Health Festival. And as every year I enjoyed joining and Unity brought me on camera in this uh, studio concept and we went on recording a very nice chat to wrap up the entire event. So I really was looking forward to the opportunity to reciprocate this. And so I'm very happy to welcome my friend Unity to the virtual stage of Frontiers Health. Unity. Roberto, how are you? It's great to be here uh, in the home stretch. What, a, what an amazing, uh, extraordinary day you guys have put on um, sharing wisdom with the world. So thank you very much for having me and for putting this great event on for, for the world. Unity, thank you so much for joining. We finally managed to get Steve at Frontiers uh, in the, uh, from the comfort of his own uh, home or office. So that, uh, you know, we, we had to bring Frontiers to him to get him on, uh, on the stage. Uh, so that's, uh, it's great to have you and uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, steer the wheel through the last segment of the, of the program. Uh, you have some amazing uh, speakers and I'll be back uh, for a closing and an a, and a arrivederci together at the end. So stage is yours, take it from here. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Roberto. Um, what an extraordinary time. You know, this session is really uh, titled Tella Everything. And I think uh, even just given the discussion we're having now and, and how we're conducting it, it's quite clear uh, the relevancy now of virtual care, of telehealth, of telemedicine. Um, and it really is a, an extraordinary moment um, where we've leapt forward. Uh, as my business partner, Steve Krein said, um, decades have happened in weeks. Um, so today, uh, I'm really excited. We're going to spend about the next 40 minutes or so um, with three extraordinary people, um, two great startup health companies to start and then uh, end with a talk uh, with Dr. Raphael Grossman, um, a surgeon and, and faculty member at Singularity University and Exponential Medicine. Um, but to kick things off, um, we're going to have two sessions with great uh, entrepreneurs, both health transformers in, in startup health and the startup health portfolio. And um, we're going to start with Marina Borakovic, who uh, is the CEO and founder of a company called Your Coach Health. And um, as you'll learn, Marina, uh, your mission is, is quite extraordinary and I think more relevant than ever uh, today. Uh, so we look forward to hearing about that. But um, let's let's turn the, the floor over to you and so we can learn about how health coaches um, are going to help the world become happier and healthier over the coming years. Uh, Marina, welcome. I love that. Thank you, Unity. Thank you for the introduction. And it's so great to be here. Um, let me just start sharing my screen. Um, Unlike my husband, Eugene, who a lot of you know, I'm very much of an introvert. So I don't normally need hugs or human contact all that much, but even now could use some hugs. You know, it's a, it's been a long few months. So it's really great to connect with everybody, even in this virtual environment. Um, before I guess we go into what your coach does, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how we got here. Um, so about a little over five years ago, um, I was a patient, I was a cancer patient. And um, in my diagnosis, I was very lucky that I was treated by really some amazing doctors and surgeons and they got me back to health. But even after I was supposed to be at my hole, I realized that a lot of things were missing and that was the emotional well-being and the mental well-being. And in order to heal myself holistically, I went on to become a health coach. And in doing so, I realized what it is that I needed and I wanted to bring it to more people and to be able to help more people. 
And I reached out to my co-founder and business partner and I asked them, I'm like, let's, let's build something. Let's build this great thing. And that's how your coach started. So this is what it is. It's, um, one second. Looks like there may be a, uh, little technical glitch there. Marina, are you there? Uh, I am here. Okay. Let me try it this came again. Back. Okay. Very it unstable like connection. For a second. Okay, is this better? Can you see it? We can see it. Okay, awesome. So I don't know where you left me. I left you, but um, just wanted to say that if you're a coach, we empower health and wellness coaches by helping them manage, grow, and track their uh, business. So in growing, uh, one of the tools that we use is telecoaching, as we call it. So it's uh, one of the tele-everything platforms. And uh, instead of telemedicine, we call it telecoaching. And we also help them track outcomes because we find that it's really important. And our mission at Yorko, which and you touched upon that before, is that by year 2030, for the projected 9 billion people in the world to have access to global squads of health coaches in order to heal holistically mind, body, and soul. Um, I guess before we go any further, we should talk about what a health coach is. Um, so a certified health coach is a trusted partner and mentor who empowers individuals to both identify and achieve their goals related to health, wellness, and mindset. And that has not been as important as it is right now. And we put together this little graphic to kind of talk about the importance of health coaching. So the healthcare industry, which most of us come from and where we're patients, is playing between the sick um, and the, the genes, right? So, and I'm never going to discount the genes and what what major part they play in our well-being, but there's also this category of people who just want to be better, healthier versions of themselves. And these, in the middle of all of this is the behavior because it's all about the behavior change. It's about the motivation and the mindset and the behavior modification in order for us to be healthier and happier. And that has never been as important as it is now. And in the midst of this pandemic, when when all of this really started as a company, we made a decision to give our platform to coaches for free because we decided that they need this now more than ever to connect with their clients in order to help them uh, the most that they can. Um, so I know Jerry just had a panel about mental illness and I wanted to touch upon that a little bit as well. And this is a great slide that was put together by our friends at Masala Fund. And it just outlines what an important part mental illness and mental wellness really plays um, in, in our everyday lives. And this is these are the numbers. I mean, these are outrageous numbers. And this was done before the pandemic. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is mental illness, it's such an encompassing, it's such a huge thing, but there's different aspects to it. Right. So as therapists are really amazing at treating and, you know, they're psychologists and they're psychiatrists and they work with patients, there's a role of health coaches because mental illness, it's not just that there's a reason for it. And when this pandemic happened and some of us have been locked up for three months, some of us have been locked up for two months, we really thought that this is going to be a really temporary thing. And some people decided they're going to work on themselves. Some people decided they're going to relax. Some people were just waiting it out, spending time with families. And now that we're realizing that there's really no end in sight, and I know people are talking about it as the new normal, but I'm going to venture to say it's just the normal. This is just the way things are going to be from now on. A lot more mental issues are coming into play here. And people are getting depressed. They're getting upset. They don't really know what to do. And that's where health coaches come in as well. They play such an important role because underneath this, it's sleep and it's nutrition and it's exercise. It's a lot of these factors that play into this. I mean, just an interesting side note, um, I had my birthday yesterday and normally I get Facebook messages and I get WhatsApps and I get a few texts, right? So yesterday it was video calls and it was phone calls and it was conversations because I think everybody's just missing the human contact. Um, we all want to talk and we all want to support and we just all want to be there for each other. And I just thought that was such an incredible connection. So in when all of this happened and we have always been a telecoaching platform. So for our business, nothing has really changed. But we noticed this interesting shift where we've been approached by a few uh, digital therapeutic companies because they needed coaches 
they wanted coaches on demand to help with with their product. And now that the FDA's enforcement uh, discretion policy, so the psychiatric disorders only, the pathway to market has been expedited. Um, a lot more uh, digital therapeutics companies are coming into play here, and a lot more of them are needing health coaches. And this is where we're working together with, the, with, with, with digital therapeutics in order to just um, give them this workforce, right? To help them, um, to, to help them better their models, to give that human connection. Because the technology is amazing and these technologies have been in patients' hands digitally for a very long time, but now we can enhance it with the human touch and the human connection. And now we can help even more people. So this is something that we do. So um, we help digital therapeutic companies now to validate, verify, and onboard coaches, these coaches on demand. And these coaches are establishing new behaviors using the digital therapeutic with their clients. And this is done through behavior modifications, through motivation, through mindset, and basically motivational techniques. And then there's follow through, and then we're tracking outcomes. We're making sure that these coaches that we provide that we help them find and we help them on board and these therapies that they're really being these, they're helping people be better, healthier, happier, especially at a time like this. So this is a really like fun little graphic we put together because I think at the center of it all, at the heart of it all, we really just want to be happy humans. We just really want to be happy. And I think it kind of divides into two camps. So there's those that want to be better and the, there are those that want to feel better. So the people that want to be better are the quote unquote healthy people where they just want to maybe look a little better. They want to better their nutrition. They want to manage their stress. They want to maybe get a little bit more sleep. And then th there are those that want to feel better. And these are people that are battling chronic conditions. Um, it's the hypertension. It's the thyroid disorders. It's oncological issues. I mean, it's a, a whole array of things. And people just want to be better. So what we're trying to do, what we're doing is with our Your Coach Power, which is the algorithms that we're working on to make sure that the right people, the right clients, the right happy humans are matched with the right coaches, with the health coaches that we have at our disposal, these amazing humans that are so good at what they do. And in these squads where they come together based on different special specialties, but in mind of what the client needs at the center of it all. And with these digital therapies, this is how we're helping shape this happy humans. This is how we're hoping to make this normal, this new normal, this regular normal. This is how we're hoping to make it just a little bit better. So as always, I'm going to ask you to join us on a health coaching revolution. So if you're a therapeutic company, if you want to work together, if you want to see how we can make this better, talk to us because this is what we want to do. This is this is our mission. And I'm also really happy to announce that in September, we're going to be having our first global health and well-being coaching symposium. And it's uh, helping shape healthy, happy humans. Uh, so we're bringing, it's an international event. We're bringing coaches together from all over the world. And we're going to be talking about reimbursements. And we're going to be talking about new trends. And if you know me, there's going to be a few little taboo topics thrown in there as well, just to make it a little interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is what we're doing and please join us. Thank you for having me. Stay happy, stay safe, stay healthy, and um, hopefully to see everyone soon. Marina, Marina, first of all, happy birthday to you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you know, I just, I love just this, the, the heart and soul of what you're saying. You know, this is really about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, happy humans. Um, and, and what I find striking about uh, your, your innovation here is while the backbone is technology and while we're in this construct of a telehealth discussion, really what you're talking about is human connection and, and the human aspect of it. So it's really quite extraordinary. Thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Uh, and Eugene uh, very, very soon. Thank you. So we are going to continue uh, the discussion um, with another health transformer uh, from Startup Health. Uh, this, 
this company Care uh, Care Predict um, is is really extraordinary. There's actually a great New York Times uh, feature this week, um, I think two days ago, about what Care Predict is doing um, with contact tracing in nursing homes. Um, so hope everyone checks that out. Um, welcome, Jerry uh, Wilnick, who's the chief business officer of, of Care Predict. Um, a completely uh, interesting uh, innovation that's been around for for a few years, but is more relevant than ever. Um, like so many of the solutions we've been talking about over the course of the day. Um, Jerry, over to you to share um, what you are doing at Care Predict. Unity, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Jerry Wilmake. I'm the Chief Business Officer and of Care Predict. And I really broke this presentation into kind of two discrete parts. One, as Stephen Crane had discussed, BC. So before COVID-19 and after COVID-19 and how at Care Predict, we went through a two or three week sprint to leverage the technology we had in place for our customers to provide them an instantaneous contact tracing solution for senior residents who are the most vulnerable during this period. Can you see my screen clearly as well, Unity? Yes. Okay, just making sure. So Care Predict was founded in 2013 by our founder and CEO, Satish Mova, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We have a second location where our CTO and our super smart people, data science teams work. Uh, we are in our Series B round now and have been scaling quite quickly. We are most known for, BC, this is BC, our continuous machine observation system which consists of a wearable device, a wireless beacon, and a deep learning platform that we developed where we measure changes in a senior's activity and behavior and use those changes to predict when they're at risk for a fall, depression, or even UTI. And I'll go into more detail on in the, in the next few slides. I am really humbled to be on this Care Predict executive team. Uh, we are led by our uh, founder and CEO, Satish Mova, who has, for 20 or 30 years, been developing revolutionary digital health products and technology products. And I'm really a privilege to work with him. Also, Greg Zobel and Dave Marcilla. We have launched products and been noticed um, and awarded several, several awards in recent years. One, AI Times, one of the top 25 AI companies in the world. More recently, Digital Health 150 by CB Insights and even in uh, January of 2020, the Consumer Electronics Show. We have proven results with our technologies and we submitted our uh, outcome study to JMIR Aging, which is in deep review now, where we demonstrated we could actually lower hospitalization rates by 40% and fall rates by 64%. And I'll also talk about some of the details of that study later. We have very significant traction we have thousands of users and customers all across the United States and Japan, and this is in senior living and in home care. I always like to have this slide to kind of lay the backdrop for Care Predict and also for digital health in general. Many moons ago, families lived together. And this is beautiful. You had your grandmother, an older adult, and the grandchildren all under one roof. This is very advantageous to recognizing when grandma was going through something or going through changes that maybe needed medical assistance. Um, by having our eyes in on grandma during uh, in that home, it allowed us to really make sure that she got the best care possible. Well, you fast forward now through several phases of industrialization and urbanization, and we're geographically dispersed as we are in this call. And we don't have the ability to see those changes in grandma on a daily basis. You know, and this has really been fueling the importance of digital health technologies and in particular, um, Care Predicts technologies for senior care. To compound that problem, we have an increasing number, uh, the fastest growing population is 85 plus, and the number of caregivers is not, taking, it's not keeping up at the same pace. You know, currently in 2020, we have seven family caregivers for one senior. By 2050, we're going to have three. So it's clearly not keeping pace. 
And we also see this in the home care with paid caregivers as well, where the number of seniors is increasing 50% over the next 10 years and paid caregivers is maybe a million. Um, so it just can't keep up with it. And in addition, the taxpayers that pay for those services for seniors is not keeping up as well. So the bottom line is we're too few to provide the care and too few to pay for the care. And this is being pronounced even during COVID-19 now as well, because we're shelling out trillions of dollars to get our economy back to a healthier place. So it's going to be the impacts are going to be significant going forward. So in summary, we're geographically dispersed. We can't see the effects um, and changes in grandma to get her care in a prompt manner. And the, the number of seniors and the number of caregivers is not keeping pace with the growth of the senior population. We really need machines and digital health tools. Over the past few years, we've seen a variety of connected thermometers and connected blood pressure devices that are very reactive in nature. Uh, so it can pick up maybe a change in blood pressure, which then would trigger me to go to the doctor, get some type of intervention, maybe a medication because I'm diagnosed with hypertension. This is really great, but it's really downstream. We want to move upstream as much as possible. So at Care Predict, the premise behind the business is that when you are suffering a health decline, one of the earliest signs is you'll actually have a change in activity and behavior before you'll have changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and other of those vital physiological measurements. So if we can somehow accurately measure those changes in behavior, we can predict, for instance, when a senior is depressed or about to suffer a urinary tract infection or a fall or even malnutrition. We have, over the years since 2015, trained models based on labeled data. And we have a variety of different conditions that we can actually predict, including depression, UTI, and fall risk. Um, there's a lot on this slide, so I'm not gonna go through it, but there's a ton of different correlates that we use and that we've confirmed with other types of testing that they're effective. So you're probably wondering, how does this magic work? And the, the system is very, very simple. We've designed a wearable device specifically for seniors that's worn on their dominant arm. It picks up subtle changes in the kinematics of their wrist so then it can identify their personalized gestures when they're eating, drinking, participating in physical activity, brushing their teeth, and takes that information to our cloud system, which then makes um, plots their baseline and flags deviations when they go outside one or two standard deviations. Um, in addition, the wearable uh, also houses a, uh, a series of sensors for heart rate detection and also pulse ox, so we can measure SpO2 levels, which has actually become incredibly important during this uh, COVID-19 times. Here's a snapshot kind of showing what our really smart people do with the data and how, they, how we host this in an AWS cloud and then send that to our machine learning models. Um, it's a very extensive um, system that we've built both on the hardware and software side. Here's a snapshot of our outcome study in group living. And what we found with, this is roughly about 500 uh, senior residents in six different communities. We, after a 24 month evaluation period, we actually saw a 40% reduction in hospitalization rate and 64% reduction in falls. We improved our staff response by 37% and increased the length of stay by 67%. Now AC. So the pandemic hit, our customers, our senior living customers, assisted living facilities, independent living communities, we, we recognized quite early on that SARS-CoV-2 was going to impact a, the, the senior population. And we've seen it with the data, 80% of all deaths are adults 70 plus. And the reason for why it's so significant in the, and why nursing homes and assisted living are so high risk is that you have residents that are living closely together. You have staff that are visiting one, um, each resident and going from room to room. And the staff are providing assistance to those residents, activities, of, providing them activities of daily living assistance, which is very intimate, frequent contact, eating, drinking, bathing. And we've seen the death rates where in the United States and in Italy, 40% of the COVID-19 deaths have been residents in care homes or nursing homes. So we knew we needed specialized tools. And the importance of specialized tools in this time 
it has really been highlighted in, in the media lately where there's a, a um, news on the contact tracing capabilities. And what manual contact tracing is, is it allows you to box in the virus so it doesn't transmit to primary and secondary contacts quickly. The problem is SARS-CoV-2 moves fast. So you need really rapid testing and tracing tools. If you conduct a manual contact tracing, a primary case is identified, isolated, and then a tracer from a public health uh, association would actually call them, do a two hour interview, and then they would actually identify the high risk and low risk contacts that they made. The limitation of this is one, the time it takes to conduct these interviews, and two, the individual may miss a lot of the contacts. They just may forget um, contacts that they made. And so now these are carriers that can transmit it through a community, which is what we've seen in nursing homes. Big tech has also stepped up to the plate um, with smartphones. And the idea here is an app on the smartphone and using Bluetooth technology can identify if an infected person uh, came in contact with another individual. This will work incredibly well for public spaces and random incidental contacts, but will be limited in senior living settings, uh, primarily because um, one, a significant percentage of seniors do not have smartphones. And two, the staff actually are not allowed to use smartphones in these communities. And then the technical limitation is Bluetooth is, can actually transmit thin walls very easily. And so you can get a lot of false positives due to Bluetooth bleeding. So this is our system. Leveraging our wearable devices, which our staff and residents uh, have already been using, our real-time location system and our room location beacons. We have very accurate information on when an individual is in direct contact with a particular person. And we can also do screening to identify the location to which could be contaminated. So here's a simple example. Am I doing okay on time unity? Yeah, you got another minute here. Okay. So here's a quick example, and I'll show you our, um, our dashboard. So say a staff member, Joe, tests positive for COVID-19. The staff will then go into our pinpoint software, go back 14 days, click run, and within seconds, they will have a, a report on all the individuals that was in direct contact with, potentially after his latent period, so he was infectious. And then they can isolate those individuals and quarantine them immediately. This is incredibly important. And if you're trying to just do symptom monitoring or um, PCR testing, you, you can miss all those individuals and they would continue to spread the virus. This uh, version two of the pinpoint software. Um, there's very detailed reports that can be exported from the software, but you get a list um, of the individuals. So this is from Michael Smith whether he tested positive or negative and whether he's isolated or not. You then get a full representation of all those direct contacts and also indirect contacts. So an infected person may actually infect an entire room. And during that period, it, it, there may be aerosols in the air, um, there are tiny droplets of droplet nuclei, or the surfaces in that room may be infected. So now you can decontaminate those rooms and make sure that no one gets uh, infected from those surfaces due to fomite transmission. I have really enjoyed uh, being on this call tonight and thank you for the opportunity um, and unity. Thanks again. I, I wish we were in, uh, in Louisville cheering on those horses right now. But, uh, One year that was ago, last year. One year ago, we were together at the, at the horse races. Um, Jerry, thank you um, and everything Satish and the whole team are doing. It's, it's quite extraordinary. I know your solution, you didn't mention this, but it's, this is a global solution. It's, it's, of course, deployed throughout the U.S., um, but also in other countries as well. Um, and it's just extraordinary how you've taken your platform and so quickly made it um, even more relevant um, as a result of pandemic response. So thank you uh, again, Jerry, for, for everything and look forward to seeing you and the team soon. Um, thank so you. Keep things going here. To close out uh, today's session, I'd like to introduce... Um, Dr. Rafael uh, Grossman, a surgeon and health innovator um, who performed the first surgery documented by Google Glass, uh, I think back in 2013, um, maybe 2012 or 13. Rafael is on the faculty um, at both Singularity University and Exponential Medicine. 
Um, and we'll be talking about how it's not just telemedicine, uh, it's just medicine. So um, here, here on that, Raphael, the stage is yours. The virtual stage is yours. And you may be on mute. You're on mute. Still on mute. Now I have control. There Great. you go. Thank you very much. It's uh, really a pleasure to, to be here. And, and uh, I'm a little bit late and right on the clock because I just finished my trauma call. <laughs> so, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the, the invitation. I'm gonna share my screen in here real quick uh, to go through a, <clears throat> a brief presentation. And uh, um, let's say you should be able to see my screen now, correct? Perfect. Well, good. So, a uh, pleasure to be here again. I uh, uh, am a, a general surgeon. I'm pretty a, a, a much a geek surgeon, I think, because I'm really passionate about technology. Uh, I am very active in social media. I try to be and active on my on my blog side, which is uh, just a communicational, informational side with no commercial interest or no conflict of interest. But uh, a, a, in a Twitter, a, which is a platform that I've been around uh, a, a with uh, for about 10 years, I really a, use it as, a, as an exchange for information. And uh, a lot of the stuff that we discuss here, it's uh, a, from uh, links and, 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 and the contacts and, and, and people that, that I've met and uh, have become then real good physical friends uh, through, through Twitter. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to connect. As you said, I'm a general surgeon. I'm a full-time clinical surgeon. I, I do general surgery and trauma surgery, uh, trauma and emergency surgery. And the other half of what I do is uh, uh, related to uh, high-end technology, minimally invasive surgery, robotic surgery. So it's really, really uh, about finding how technology can help us do a better job, right? Caring for, for patients. Uh, that brought me a... a to, uh, to really immerse myself in uh, exponential technologies and then get in touch with uh, my good friend Dan Kraft and went to faculty to um, exponential medicine and eventually became faculty. But it said to me about how the smart use of technology can improve, can enhance how we care for patients, how we communicate and how we connect. Because I think that the, the root of all problems in medicine, if not in anything, but especially in medicine, is a uh, the lack of uh, or uh, the poor uh, connectivity and communication that we have these days. Uh, after exponential medicine, on my first experience there, when it was called Future Med, I had the pleasure to meet Babak Parvis, the uh, inventor of Google Glass. And when I saw what Google Glass could do, I said, this tool will revolutionize how we connect and communicate, how we teach, how we uh, uh, do uh, telemedicine, telehealth, teleeducation, tele everything. So I went ahead and did the first operation just to show a group of students uh, through the Google Glass that you're all probably all familiar with uh, how my perspective uh, was. I could uh, talk to them. I could listen to them. I could answer questions, ask questions, but always showing my perspective. So a really different way of uh, doing a, 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 a teaching. Uh, also in the hospital, the medical rounds. This is uh, from Lucian Engelin, my good friend from Radboud University, formerly a, a, a proof of concept about what, ga uh, what the glass could do, right? So basically enabling us to integrate the digital medical record, right? But also even bring someone from a distance, right? Uh, as in a teleconsultation or a telemedical consultation. So this device was really, I think, the first time that a, a, a real factual a, a augmented reality device with a really good design was a, a up uh, for, for gigs in the operating room. And that was, a, that was really a good experience that then uh, propulsed a lot of all the developments uh, out there uh, in healthcare, in the operating room, developments that, for example, my good friend Shafi Ahmed then exponentially uh, impulsed and, and uh, all about the technology used in a smart fashion. And uh, I'm really passionate about this because you know we talk about healthcare all the time but we know that we don't do healthcare you know what we do is sick care you know always too late always too poorly and it's because of that a, a sort of mantra that I have that we don't use technology in a smart way and that's a problem 
I think that a technology, if used in a wise manner, the technology that we have available today in the 21st century, in the year 2020, can enable us to do humane care, much better humane care. Paradoxically, that technology can make us closer as human beings, uh, despite what some people think. You know, in medicine, especially in surgery, but in medicine, it's all about watching. That's how you learn medicine, right? But that's how you also uh, 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 explain to relatives or to a patient, you know, what they're going to embark about in order to get you, for example, a informed consent. Same thing in the operating room. So with technologies uh, available, uh, 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 we, we can really enhance and augment how we do this. Has been a, a, a revolution of those. You know, I don't talk about revolutions because I'm from Venezuela, so I always say our evolution. So, and it is, it's about technology exponentially enhancing, improving, becoming, you know, faster, better, cheaper, up to the level of the Google Glass. And that little gift I always present because it gives you a, a progression very quickly of how we went from these laptops that were, you know, several pounds <laughs> to what we have now, which are computers basically in our watches or, you know, the supercomputers we all carry in our, in our, in our, in our pockets, right? So I think it's really about uh, that. So uh, when people talk about tele, what, tele, health, telemedicine, telecare, teleconsultation, to me is about tele everything, right? Because there is no real reason to, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, concentrate in one area of the teleconnectivity. This is a San Fernando de Atabaco. This is a small town village in the middle of the Amazon, no connectivity with anything else around it in the middle of the Amazon territory in Venezuela, where I did my three months of a rural internship as a student in my last year of med school. And imagine, the, this is in the, in the 90s, imagine the, the connectivity that we had there it was zero. We didn't ha even have a landline. So uh, the, the concept of communicating and connecting was really important. The closer that I could uh, connect, it was run to the mission, you know, to ask the nuns for a microscope so I can diagnose malaria for example. Uh, there was no way to communicate otherwise. And uh, uh, that got my passion for telemedicine. And we've been talking about telehealth and telemedicine very much a, a lot these days, right? Especially the COVID. After years and years and years of trying to push telemedicine and telehealth, uh, going through a lot of barriers and obstacles and barely moving forward, in about a week or so, COVID-19 came and boom, everyone is doing telemedicine. I talk about, you know, we all heard about a, a necessity being the mother of invention, right? I think that in this case, desperation is the mother of invention. You know, because we're no other way of seeing patients, right? So if you want to see a doctor, you had to basically go to the ED and get exposed and be, you know, be at risk or just connect to one of the screens. So the regulators, the administrators, the providers, the patients, the relatives, any and everyone basically embrace the technology in order to to communicate in a, in, a, in a better way and we've been doing it for years in Maine where I work you know hundreds of miles difference between patients and us right and we created all these systems with the big screens in there and we could bring the patients in and we could connect to the providers that referred the patients to us and do telemedicine and, and that was somewhat successful we put screens and computers to do telemedicine in every room in the hospital and whatnot and then this happened right 2011 you know the iPhone 4 with a FaceTime and boom, right? What happened? The first FaceTime call, right? Live in there. And uh, you know, that was a, a somewhat uh, right uh, successful, but I think that we don't anticipate, you know, the long-term success of, of, uh, of, this, of this technology, right? Uh, uh, we don't because uh, uh, nowadays it's so easy to communicate that we forget about it. So when this happened, we started doing a, um, a pilot to do telemedicine for trauma consultations in Maine, hundreds of miles away between hospitals, and we used iPod touch devices. That was a, a program we called iPod Teletrauma, where using an iPod touch that cost a couple hundred bucks, we connected to seven other hospitals to do telemedicine consultations. This is back in 2011, and uh, that was my first TEDx talk. You know, out of five TEDx talks, this was the one that I liked the best because it was really a very revolutionary concept. And uh, then if we think about how far we have come, you know, with connecting by video and audio, this is Marty Cooper, inventor of the a smartphone back in 73. I had the pleasure of meeting him at Exponential Medicine. And this is one of the things that when you go to Exponential Medicine, you don't know what fabulous thing is going to happen to you so you know the sweetest guy you know he showed me the original device and it was like 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 a dream come true right and now you know again we have these devices that have all sorts of capabilities and then fat uh, whatsapp uh, came uh, up you know 
two billion people use WhatsApp in the world. And uh, and uh, a, a, in Latin America, for example, telemedicine is done by WhatsApp, by text, by voice, or by video in an encrypted fashion, completely free. So the potential of that, right, to, to communicate and connect better. And then Zoom, which kind of took a little bit of a of a, of a, of a of an impulse up, right, right before the COVID hit, and then COVID hit, and boom, you know, they they they, they exponentially, you know, raised their, their popularity, and everyone is doing everything in life via Zoom. And uh, because I don't have that much time, I'm just going to jump a little bit. But you see, you know, we have chatbots, right? We have chatbots uh, that, that really uh, uh, supplement, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Wilkins was talking about the, 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 the supply demand imbalance that we have. Well, we don't have enough humans with healthcare a, 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 a sort of a, a knowledge in a way to guide the basic steps in the first interaction in healthcare. So we could use chatbots and we can use chatbots that have avatars and avatars like the ones uh, for uh, UniQ, right? That are avatars that are smart in a way and they look human. The avatars that look human and they did a, a, a sort of a great project for the COVID pandemic where we had this, this beautiful selfie with with human, you know, expressions, basically AI, you know, artificial intelligent algorithms answering, a, a listening, understanding and answering, you know, certain questions in, in, in healthcare related to COVID. And then you have what the human Center AI for a, a, a magic leap has done with, uh, with Micah, right? With Micah, it looks like a human. You see that video and it looks like the video of you, Unity and I, and, it, and she's like, she smiles and she sweats and it's just amazing powered with human-centered AI. So those algorithms are really going to be revolutionary. And this is a little video I wanted to show, and I'm going to try to shut up for a second and let you guys watch. But this is impression, incredible. Station, this is Uniform Services, University of the Health Sciences. How do you hear me? Uniform Services, University of the Health Sciences, I have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. so this is the ultimate telemedicine right for a long period of time it's it's outstanding i can't say enough great things about them absolutely Good afternoon, Colonel Morgan. Um, second Lieutenant David. This son of one of my colleagues and one of my partners. Uh, my question is: If someone had a medical emergency on the space station, how would it be handled? And if necessary, how long would it take to transport them back to Earth? Yes, uh, we deal with medical emergencies. The way I like to uh, view it is as a three-tiered approach. The first approach is prevention. We do a really we have a highly uh, pre-screened population. We have have uh, we are imaged and tested uh, inside and out and so they really know what risk they're buying with each astronaut and uh, so that's our first method but secondly as I mentioned like I'm in regular contact with my flight surgeon uh, Dr. Schering on the ground we have robust telemedicine capabilities so we have the ability to consult over uh, over radio over telephone um, with face-to-face, -face, you know, Skype style, uh, where we can actually see each other. Um, we have medications um, pre, uh, pre positioned on board. In fact, I brought a medical treatment pack just to, to demonstrate that and, and uh, some of the contents, familiar things like stethoscopes, floating air. And uh, <laughs> then and in an extreme, we do have the capability of, of being able to evacuate a patient the problem with that would be that if we had to send a patient back to earth then we would have to send the all their their crewmates too so we'd have to send three people back but theoretically we could get somebody that had say a surgical emergency on the ground within a day so I thought this was fantastic when I heard about this, right? This is the ultimate telemedicine. And you have all these tools that can, it's not just about connecting and communicating, you know, face-to-face -face audio and video. You know, you have, you know, something like a life core where you can basically have a, a, an EKG, you know, medical grade EKG basically at home, you know, for very inexpensive, in a very inexpensive way. This is what I use, uh, my, the Echo Duo, which is a Bluetooth stethoscope. These days with the COVID, you know, I don't have to bring my stethoscope, but, you know, I, I can just plug it 
by Bluetooth to my uh, ear plugs. If I want to do an ultrasound, I can do an ultrasound and send the images remotely in real time. I can have someone, you know, be a telus, a, 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 you know, I can, I can have someone teach me or I can teach remotely how to do an ultrasound. This plugs basically to your smartphone. This is the butterfly ultrasound. And you even have the ability, you know, with a, a, something like an aura ring or something like the Omron watch with a blood pressure watch infinite number of, of possibilities to not just see each other, hear each other, but also transmit medical data. This is the Med One device uh, that, that, that basically does a lot of other functions and all remotely, all designed for telemedicine, right? So uh, the, what I liked about the video from the International Sta uh, Space Station is that you can see how it's not an, a, a, a substitution. It's an alternative, a complement, right, to what we normally do. Hey, if you have to go back to Earth, we'll send you to Earth or vice versa, right? But it is another way to enhance how that, you know, interaction between the physician, the provider, and the patient happens. And uh, I briefly wanted to go uh, uh, through this, uh, uh, you know, uh, concept of VR, AR, and XR because they're pertinent to telemedicine in a very big way, I think. And I think I, I still have time. You need to, right? They've got a uh, couple minutes here. Yeah. So basically, we're all familiar with uh, spatial computing. The desktop is in the space, right? We use all these devices. Uh, you know, we know about MS-DOS uh, computing, the first era of computer, graphic user interfaces, which is the the the, the basically the, the the Apple interface with icons in the in the desktop uh, to the touch screens to you know what uh, uh, basically we have now, which is the spatial computing. And I'm going to go through this, but uh, uh, our tools are multiple, right? It's not the typical uh, medical and surgical tools. We have other tools uh, nowadays. This is uh, a, a brain lab uh, and magic leap where you can really use the space to uh, in 3D, in a holographic sort of way, you can see images and you can, anything you can do on a desktop, but better you can do in the in this space. The potential for tele-education, for tele-teaching, for tele-consulting, for explaining to someone how to basically do better surgery or explaining to a patient how the surgery is going to happen so they can give you really informed consent or exp explain to a relative, you know, how, how things are going to happen. I think that this is very uh, uh, important, right? And the ultimate, you know, you have the HoloLens, you know, this is the HoloLens 2. I don't know if many of you have seen the HoloLens. This is a marvelous computer. So from Google Glass, right, to something like this, you know, just very few years later to HoloLens 2 or something like Magic Leap, uh, I think that the progress has been astronomical. And certain factors, like, for example, COVID-19 can accelerate right that progress and not the progress itself but the 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 embracing of that progress by society or specific uh, you know uh, activity group all to something like for example a soft hydrogel a contact lens with circuitry like in with corp and this is sort of the ultimate device that will go on your eye and will be a, a wearable, right? Where you're going to have spatial computing. You're right? Imagine the potential to be able to show someone what you're seeing and remotely share that image. So it's about, you know, the supply demand. You know, 5 billion people on Earth do not have access to safe surgery or to affordable surgery. But that applies to healthcare in general. It's not just surgery. This is how surgery happens in the real world, right? This is pictures from Venezuela, you know, pictures where, you know, war zones it don't do not even get close to that, right? So this is how healthcare happens. And I was going to go through this uh, video, but really not. It's about the same concept, that healthcare is in a chaotic situation. And we really need to uh, be able to remember that healthcare is a basic human right and we have all the tools, all the tools if we use technology smart in a smart way. It is not telehealth, it is not telemedicine. I think it is just health, just medicine. So I leave it here and I'm looking forward to connect uh, with all of you. And again, thank you very much for the honor and the uh, a, a possibility, the, the opportunity to participate. Thank you very much. Rafael, thank you so much and, and any chance I get to meet a, a doctor, clinician, health professional. I just thank you for, for what you do. We need more of you in the world. Um, so thank you for sharing your room today. And we are, we are just on time, Roberto, uh, keeping it on, on pace. So <laughs> back to you, my friend. Guys, please stay here with me for a few seconds. And uh, I'm uh, super happy to wrap uh, up today's event uh, with both of you. Um, Unity has been uh, uh, 
Uh, great to have you on the program uh, for this edition of Frontiers Health, the first live, and I'm also super happy to finally manage to have Rafael uh, with us. Uh, we have been trying to do this uh, for a few years. Finally, we made it. It seems yesterday, but it was a few years ago that we were speaking one after the other in Helsinki. Uh, so finally, we got you to Frontiers. Uh, I, it, it's amazing to me that it's like uh, the conference has to come to you guys to bring you on, but I think one way or the other we made it, so that's probably uh, a good side effect of this situation we are uh, all in together. So I really want to thank you, uh, both of you, has been great to have this as a, a wrap for this uh, uh, live edition. Uh, I'm, I'm bombarded by emails about you know, questions, how we take this next, when the next slide will be. So we'll, uh, we'll certainly be back and uh, we will keep doing this all together as a global united ecosystem. So thank you, uh, Unity. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, stay tuned for the final closing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.